Okay, so today's class is going to be on, um, let me keep this. Today's class is going to be on basic electrical, um, basic electrical theory, uh, and really kind of even before applicable theory, I just want to go through a little bit of, um, really, I guess it's, it's atomic theory. It's going over what electrons are and protons and those types of things. So, um, so let's go ahead and do that. Back to the small, where we begin our climb up the ladder of structure. This is how we represent an electron visually. The particle itself is a fundamental particle and is too small to be seen by any imaginable instrument of observation. So we instead represent the properties that allow the electron to interact. The central small dot represents the weak charge of the electron. This charge, entirely separate from electric charge, gives rise to the weak nuclear force. This force causes radioactive decay. And this, okay, this guy uses a lot of really fancy words, but don't focus on the really fancy words. Focus on a lot of the visuals that he gives. That, the visuals are really good. Um, he's, he's kind of impressed by some of the fancy words that he says. Don't worry about that. And its typical range is much smaller than the diameter of a proton. The larger volume of shifting purple is meant to represent the electric charge of the electron. This charge is the generator of the electromagnetic force which has infinite range. Although the drop off of strength is pretty dramatic as we move away from the electron. The electromagnetic force is how electrons interact with other electrically charged particles and with magnetic fields. These interactions make the structure of atoms and molecules possible. This gives rise to almost all of the complexity that we see around us. This is our depiction of a proton. It is composed of two up quarks and one down quark, as you can see from the tiny rings of color near the center of the quark. The overall charge of the proton is positive, and so we have given it a gold shell. Note that we can simply add the charges of the individual quarks to get the charge of a proton. Oh, protons taste sour, like vinegar and lemonade. This is our depiction of a neutron. It is composed of two down quarks and one up quark, as you can see from the tiny rings of color near the center of the quark. The overall charge of a neutron is neutral, so we have given it a silver shell. Note that we can simply add the charges of the individual quarks to give the charge of the neutron. The red, green, and blue colors of the quarks represent the color charge which generates the strong nuclear force that holds them together. It comes in three different charges, represented here by three colors. And for different colors, the force is attractive. The mediator of the strong force, the particle that is exchanged in an interaction, is a gluon. We represent gluon exchange as the occasional wispy string between the quarks. As you can see, the gluons have color themselves, and each gluon exchange causes the quark involved to swap color. Although we show quark motion inside of the neutron as leisurely, they are actually traveling close to the speed of light. There are two kinds of quarks that are found in normal matter. Physicists call them flavors of quarks. These quarks are the up quark and the down quark. A proton is formed from two up quarks and one down quark. While its slightly heavier cousin, the neutron, is formed from two down quarks and one up quark. The red, green, and blue colors of the quarks represent a property that attracts them to one another. It is this color charge property of the quarks that hold them together in a proton or a neutron. These protons and neutrons can then combine to form the nucleus of each element in the periodic table. One proton in the nucleus 
makes hydrogen. Two form helium. Six carbon. Eight oxygen. Seventy nine is gold. And ninety two uranium. Neutrons help hold the protons together. Because of their electric charge, protons would repel each other more strongly if neutrons were not present. And the heavier elements would come apart. There are approximately as many neutrons in each element as there are protons. Atoms are formed when the positively charged protons in the nucleus capture the negative electrons. Neutral atoms capture one negative electron for each positive proton in the nucleus. So, hydrogen has one electron to go with its one proton. Helium, two electrons. Carbon has six. Oxygen, eight. Gold has 79. And uranium, 92. There are nearly 90 stable elements. The largest of them contain close to 800 fundamental particles joined in a complex but stable structure. But electrons cannot just gather around in a crowd. Once again, the strange, wonderful world of the tiny has its idiosyncrasies. Electrons arrange themselves in shells inside an atom like the layers of an onion. And only two electrons can fit per layer. So the more electrons an atom has, the further away from the nucleus the outer shells must be. And that means these electrons are more loosely held. Okay. I want to say real quick about that, that <clears throat> scientists always try to explain things like that because that, it, like for example, he said only two electrons can be held in each one of these rings, okay? Well, he doesn't really know why. He's just saying that that's sort of been observed. But even then, you can't see an electron. So they really don't know what they're talking about. They're really, what they're trying to do is they're making laws and principles in order to explain why what they see to, or what they observe actually occurs. So they say things like it's absolute, when really it's just kind of what they've come to base a theory around. It is this difference in how tightly electrons are held in each different kind of atom that determines the chemical properties of the element. This accounts for the ability of metals to conduct electricity, the aloofness of noble gases, and the formation of molecules. It turns out that protons in two or more different nuclei can sometimes capture and fight over the same electron. And when that happens, atoms of different elements are joined together to form molecules. This oxygen molecule is sharing two of its electrons with two hydrogen atoms. This is how a water molecule is formed. The reason why I showed you a really highly uh, scientific view of what electrons are and what atoms are is to make it clear that it's really not simple. And that's important because the way that I explain it is simple or is simplistic in thinking because I'm taking essentially what they're doing, which is, you know, he, he starts with talking about quarks and how protons and neutrons are made up of different types of quarks and things. Well, if no one's ever seen an electron, they've certainly never seen a quark. It's essentially a theory that they've develop that works and they can apply it into science but um, but even when you break it down to that level which is still a very simple level compared to you know quantum theory going really deep into quantum theory 
it's still very complex and it has nothing to do with what we actually interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. So when I talk about um, electrons, basically what I, I, what I want you to understand is when I say an electron, know that an electron's true nature is not really known. You don't really know that much about an electron. So I give examples of how we see them work in day-to-day -day life. All that, all that he was talking about there is this idea of building opposing forces onto each other and the attraction and repelling nature of opposing forces, okay? This is a very core thing that I always come back to when you're thinking about electrical theory, is that really we can call it a negative force, we can call it a positive force, we can call it whatever, but it doesn't matter what you call it. The concept is, is that this wants to go there, or these two want to go towards each other, or these two want to go away from each other. Um, a good way of thinking about forces in a simplistic way that we all observe is you take a stone and you drop it and it falls. Okay? One way of saying that is, well, obviously, you know, gravity means that what goes up must come down. It's a simplistic way of saying it. Really, <clears throat> energy tends towards equilibrium is, is another way. It's the way I like to say it. So, for example, if you have a big uh, container of water, a big barrel, jug of water here, and you... Uh, a hole in it, well that water is going to travel out because gravitational force and atmospheric pressure are forcing it out of the, um, out of the uh, container. But what's really happening is, is it's tending to a, a state of lesser, of greater force to lesser force. It's, it's tending, uh, because, of the, because of all the forces involved, it's wanting to go to a state of equilibrium. Um, because you can think of it this way, let's say that instead of it going on the ground, this, there was a tank here full of water, and then there was another tank down here, and I created a, and they both had water in them, but I put a hose from one to the other. Well, it would fill up this tank until the two levels of these two tanks, if they, you know, were offsetting, came to a level and then it would stop, right? And the reason is, is because you have this natural equilibrium that occurs. If you take a, uh, another example of equilibrium and energy would be if I took an ice cube and I set it on this table and this room was 75 degrees, what would happen to that ice cube? Melt. It would melt. Yes. And then once it melted, it would be what on the table? Water. It would be water. And then it would continue to warm up until it came to what temperature? 75 degrees. Uh, actually, 74. Well, I, I, I said, I, I guess. But it will achieve an equilibrium with the temperature, uh, with the thermal energy around it. So it gets to that point, and then it doesn't keep getting warmer. It just maintains its equilibrium. And so with atomic theory, we're really always talking about the same thing. We're talking about things wanting to attract each other and things wanting to repel each other. There's these forces uh, at work. And like forces tend to want to repel each other, and opposite forces tend to want to attract to each other. Um, there's a song that talks about that. I'm sure Nathan knows it. Yeah. Would you, would you like to hear it sing it for us? I probably could. Okay. No. Uh, just whistle it. <laughs> Let's call that duel. Okay. I, wasn't, I wasn't quite sure who it was. Thank you for enlightening me. I want to mention that. Um, Who's that? I don't remember. So, oh, other force electros. There's a typo. Anyway, so they tend towards equilibrium, and that's an important concept to understand. Imagine you are shuffling along a carpet and reach out to touch the doorknob, and zap, you get a mild shock. What's happened is the friction between your feet and the carpet has produced a large buildup of negative electric charge on your finger. This creates what is known as electric potential difference, or voltage, between your finger and the doorknob. If the electric potential difference is large enough, a sudden flow of current called an electric discharge, will occur. Notice that I said negative electrical charge. So you build up a negative electrical charge, and then when you touch the doorknob, it zaps you. So well, wouldn't you think... Is angry? Is that why it's negative? Well, that's an that interesting thing, because in science, electrons are given a negative charge. Okay? But, but what they're talking about, in many cases, is an actual loss of charge. And so... And so you actually have, from a differential standpoint, you actually have fewer uh, electrons, and there's a greater number of electrons, and then it zaps you. 
the electricity goes this way. Well, actually, it would be the opposite. So it depends on this. Basically, it could mean either, and it really doesn't matter. What they're really saying, and I always like to point this out, because they say you have a negative electrical charge. It, it wouldn't matter. Either way, as long as you have a differential electrical charge from that of the doorknob, there's going to be a shock when you touch the doorknob, because it doesn't matter if the electricity is traveling from your finger to the doorknob or from your doorknob to the finger. It doesn't, it doesn't matter from the standpoint of how much it's going to shock you <laughs> or, the, or the amount of arc. I, I always just find that kind of humorous how they always like to attribute what type of charge it is, when really what you're talking about more accurately is which direction is the energy flowing. Is it flowing from to or to from? And it just makes it all the more, more, it makes it all the more confusing by the fact that in science an electron is given a negative charge when you would think of an electron as being a positive charge. While this can be in the form of a zap to your finger, it also happens on much larger scales in many different places. In fact, violent electric discharges are responsible for some of the most spectacular displays of sudden energy releases on Earth and in space. Let's look at one other example that you might have come across in, say, an auto body shop or at a construction site. Between a welder's tool and metal, there is a large electric voltage. This causes sparks to fly and ultimately for a strong electric current to flow. In turn, this generates a brilliant light display and enough heat to melt the metal and allow it to bond to another metallic surface. What about electric discharge on even a larger scale? One form of electric discharge that many of us have witnessed takes place during a violent storm in the form of lightning. In massive storm clouds, the friction between large particles composed of many atoms builds up a large separation of electric charge and creates voltages approaching 100 million volts. With such a big voltage, things can get explosive and the energy is released as a lightning bolt. The, the reason why I like this one is that it talks about the concept of potential difference. And and it explains some of the common places that we see it. Uh, the term potential difference is a term that is used to explain voltage, or when people talk about voltage differential, sometimes they'll call it potential difference. Um, and it's a really good word uh, in order to have a good grasp of electrical theory. When we say the word voltage, sometimes that comes to mean electricity itself to us. Like we don't really, we'll say, oh, that had a lot of voltage to it, and really we don't know what we're saying. Whereas potential difference is, an ex is, an, is a word that actually explains itself. And so it's the same way of saying, okay, I have the difference between a, this counter and an ice cube is not as great as, this, as the difference between an ice cube and a molten metal bar. Okay, there's greater thermal difference between a molten metal bar and an ice cube than there is this desk and an ice cube. We understand that difference, right? Because we measure that in degrees. Well, when it comes to electrical potential, what we're really talking about is the difference in electron charges between two objects. And it doesn't matter what they are. It can be the earth and the cloud. It can be, in the, in the case here, you, there's a great difference between this uh, uh, arc welder and the actual uh, metal, uh, the base metal being welded. There's a great differential in the, in the charges between those two, and that's all due to electrons. But the differential in number, quantity of electrons in the outside of these all these atoms um, at the very core level. But just important to understand that the reason why this arc is jumping from the welder to the metal is because of that differential. In the same way that heat energy is transferred between the ice cube in this room or the ice cube in the metal bar or the two big uh, vats of water that have a difference in height. Um, we understand it better in other contexts sometimes. Okay, getting right into specific understanding of how we get that to occur or why that occurs in the first place. Because in the case of a, an electric charge uh, with static electricity, we understand you, know, you rub a ball in your hair or whatever, and you jump on the trampoline and you, for whatever reason, uh, you develop an electrical charge and then you get shot. And, well, we don't really understand you know, why that happens when we're thinking about it, but um, it's important to recognize that we're always interacting with different chemicals. We're always interacting um, with uh, with different surfaces that have different charges. And practically, the two ways that we see energy generated is through either magnetism or a uh, chemical reaction, which is electric battery, that sort of thing. So before I move on here, I always like to ask this question. This is my favorite example. 
So how do you think a nuclear power plant creates energy? When particles are fused, they uh, release energy? Correct. That is true. We know that the, uh, well, it's actually it's actually fission. Uh, we, we would like to have fusion power plants, but we're actually splitting the nucleus of, of atoms through firing neutrons at them, essentially, and creating this chain reaction that we can control. But what does that actually do? How do we get from that explosive heat-creating reaction to actually being able to flip a switch in your house and actually see lights come on? It's water. Steam. Heats water, creates steam. And that's an interesting thing because you think you think, oh, this super scientific, you know, nuclear power plant has to have some super scientific way that it actually creates the power. No, in fact, almost all um, power generation in the United States is actually done with steam or, or some form of driving a turbine. Actually heating something and then driving a turbine and then um, and then turning the turbine and then the turbine does what? The turbine turns big magnets. And the magnets induce their magnetic flux into runs of wire. So we give a pretty, uh, I think this next video gives a pretty good example of, of how that works. It's pretty neat. Electromagnetic induction. Can a magnet produce electricity? Let's explore this. Michael Faraday. The English scientist was the first person to prove that a magnet can create a current. To test this, he moved a magnet towards and away from the coil of wire connected to a galvanometer. He observed that there was a deflection in the galvanometer, indicating that a current is induced in it. The current obtained due to the relative motion between the coil and the magnet is called induced current. The phenomenon by which an EMF or current is induced in a conductor due to a change in the magnetic field near the conductor is known as electromagnetic induction. Okay, so that's all we're going to watch with that video. because it, This magnet isn't touching this wire at all. All he's doing is he's just taking a magnet and just running it up and down, up and down, up and down, and it's actually creating a potential difference between these two poles. So in one end, all these guys just got a little meter here. One end connects to one end of the top of the wire, other end connects to the other, and it's pulled around, and, it, and he runs the magnet up and down through it, and it's creating a potential difference. He's calling it EMF. You know, the EMF just means electromotive force. Electromotive force is exactly the, it's, it's, it's exactly the same concept as saying potential difference. It's just a different way of explaining what it's doing. You have moving electrons, the force of moving electrons, electromotive force. Okay, so, but there's a differential being created between these two by doing that. So from one end to another, there's flow, basically flow of electrons from one end to the other. I like this guy. Let's talk about where your electricity comes from, how it is generated. And we need to start with Lenz's law. First, I have here a rare earth magnet, a coil of wire, and then a galvanometer. So this is a measure of how much electricity is produced. Now, Lenz's law tells us that, basically, Lenz's law is like an old man. He's trying to fight the change. So if I have a magnetic field that's increasing, 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 current's going to flow in the loop to fight that change. What's interesting is the way that he talks about fighting the change is, a, is kind of the same way of saying seeking equilibrium. It's, a, it's an opposite way of saying it, but he's really saying the same thing. What he's saying is, is that he doesn't want there to be this difference. There's a difference created. There's something that's, a, that's not a, normal, a state of normalcy, and it's trying to get back to that state of normalcy. And watch what happens as I bring the magnetic field closer. Notice that electricity is produced. As I bring it away, electricity is produced, but in the opposite direction. That's because as I bring it closer, magnetic fields increasing, increasing, increasing. Electricity is being generated this direction to create an opposing magnetic field to fight that change. Now, as I bring it away, now this magnetic field is getting smaller, smaller, smaller. So the electricity flows in the, in the other direction like this to keep it strong, to keep it where it was, to fight that change. Great. So let's take a look. A little closer. Now, as I, if I move the magnetic field slowly, 
not much electricity is being produced. But when I move it quickly, you see a whole bunch of electricity is produced. So time is a factor, and that has to do with the rate of change of the flux. How quickly, flux being the magnetic field through this area, how quickly the flux changes, well, that's proportional to how much voltage is created. And if you look at the dial closely, I'll do a quick jerk with the magnetic field, and you see a whole bunch of electricity is created. Let's stop for a second and talk about how your everyday use of electricity is created. As I spin this magnet in the coil and you see the, the electricity being generated. Well, take a windmill. A windmill is just something that spins, right? The air spins it. And when it spins, it's spinning a magnet, which is attached to it, and there's a coil of wire around it. Boom, electricity is generated. For a coal-fired plant or, or natural gas plant, well, you burn it, creates heat, that steam comes up the smokestack, that steam turns a windmill-type thing, a turbine if you like, and that has a magnet attached, so the magnet starts spinning in a coil of wire, and look at what happens, electricity is being created. Nuclear power plant, same thing. The nuclear decays, heat up the water, creates steam, turns a windmill, creates electricity. Hydro, the water turns a paddle wheel, attached to a magnet. Magnet spins in a coil of water, electricity is created. This is called a generator, and now we know where your electricity comes from. Cool, now we know where your electricity comes from, or more specifically, how your electricity is created. And we also learned about Lenz's law. As the magnetic field is increasing, increasing in this coil, well, electricity will flow in this direction, so it generates a magnetic field that opposes that change. Basically, it tries to keep it the same. Now, as I back the magnet out, then this magnetic field is getting smaller, smaller. Electricity is generated in this direction which creates a magnetic field like this to try to keep it strong in that direction. Okay, so what he's doing there is he's very simplistically trying to explain what they, what's known in magnetism uh, or in motor theory as the right hand rule. And that's why he keeps doing this and this, because what he's, what he's talking about is when you, when you move in one direction, then the, uh, then the electrons flow in this direction. You can see your fingers like this. And when you move in the other direction, then they flow in this direction. And that's what he's kind of trying to show. Now, Applicably, how does that matter? Why does that matter to us? It's very useful because there's all sorts of different applications. A couple of really common applications for us in the AC field would be a contactor, an AC contactor. You apply power, potential difference, across a coil. It creates an electromagnetic force and pulls in a switch. So in that case, what you're doing is you're using electromagnetic force to create linear motion and pull the switch in. Um, or in the case of a motor, you're actually running electricity through a coil of wire. It's the exact opposite of this power generation, where you're running electricity through a coil of coils of wire, and that alternating, you know, positive, negative, positive, negative is causing a, a, uh, a rotor to turn inside of a motor. So, you know, just like in this generator, where he's talking about spinning a magnet inside of a coil, it's creating a voltage, and you saw when he was doing that, you saw how the needle kept going like this and this, back and forth. It's going from one state of positive charge to the state of negative charge. And again, it doesn't matter because the differential from the center point, you see that needle always ended up in the center. Either way, there's a flow of electrons. And, you know, we always think, like I said, in terms of there being a you know, positive flows to negative or whatever, but it really doesn't matter. It's, it's that there's a differential. Because you could say, for example, all right, well, this, you know, I was talking about the ice. Well, this ice here is going to transfer its heat into the room in order to establish equilibrium. Well, what would happen if I took that ice and put it in a zero degree freezer? Well, now the, now the ice is going to transfer heat out of itself into the freezer. It's the opposite effect of what it would have in this room. And the same is true. And so the same amount of energy may be transferred from what we would think of as being a cold object uh, into a freezer as it would be from, you know, in this room to the room itself or from the room to the ice. Um, the same theory or the same principle is true when it comes to electricity is that it doesn't matter which direction it's flowing as long as it is flowing and and so when we see an alternating current what we're seeing is as that magnet turns the electricity is flowing one direction then the other direction one direction then the other direction and that's what we see and what we mean when we talk about alternating current the idea the principle here is is that magnetism
creates electron flow and that we see it all the time. And in the other direction, magnet, uh, electron flow can create magnetism. An induction motor is a type of AC motor where power is supplied to the rotor by means of electromagnetic induction. These motors are widely used in house fans, blowers, and many domestic and industrial appliances. They are robust, cheap, and have no brushes. An AC induction motor has two basic electrical parts, a rotor, and a stator. The stator is the stationary electrical component. It is built by putting together iron layers, forming a group of individual electromagnets arranged in such a way that they form a hollow cylinder, with one pole of each magnet facing toward the center of the group. Magnetic poles are built by winding clockwise, and anti-clockwise insulated copper wire. The coils are wound in such a way that when current flows in them, one coil is a north pole and its pair is a south pole. Now what he's trying to explain here is that each pair has its own opposite. He's not trying to say that the entire thing is north and south. What he's saying is that when this is south, this is north and vice versa. Okay, and so the way that I explain this is, think of a pinwheel. Okay, if you have a pinwheel and you and you set it, you know, you, you want to spin this pinwheel. Well, if you take it and I go and I'm slapping it like this, is that going to spin the pinwheel? Now, if I had a bunch of people who were all slapping in time, around a pinwheel and they were just do, 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 like this and, and hitting it all in, in directions in order to make it uh, in time in order to make it go a certain direction, then that would keep the pinwheel spinning. Well, that's what this is doing is it's hitting it with magnetic forces that are opposing each other in order to spin this motor and keep it going. And so essentially when, when, they, when you showed the rotor in there, that rotor isn't touching the stator at all. The stator is just creating all these different electromagnets around it. And when the elect electricity flows around it, it it's changing those uh, from negative to positive all the time and causing that that rotor inside to continue turning. Does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. So we tend to think, we always tend to think in terms of things affecting each other by physical connection. You know, we tend to think that a motor is running because something's driving that motor. Well, really, that part of that motor that's turning isn't actually touching anything. I mean, at least, no, it's not, it's not touching the thing that's actually causing it to spin. What's causing it to spin are these electromagnets. When AC power is connected to the coils, a directional flux is created depending of current's direction and winding direction of each coil. See in this animation how the magnet's polarity changes every half cycle of the AC power supply, creating an alternate magnetic field. The rotor is the rotating electrical component. It also consists of a group of electromagnets arranged around a cylinder with the poles facing toward the stator poles. The rotor, obviously, is located inside the stator. As the magnetic field of the stator alternates, due to the effect of the AC power supply, the induced magnetic field of the rotor will be attracted and will follow the rotation. It is a natural phenomena which occurs when a conductor, aluminum bars in the case of a rotor, is moved through an existing magnetic field, or when a magnetic field is moved past the conductor. In either case, the relative motion of the two causes an electric current to flow in the conductor. This is referred to as induced current flow. He actually got pretty in-depth there about what actually goes on in the rotor to actually cause it to be opposite of the forces. But you saw in the rotor part that actually spins, how there were these kind of uh, diagonal uh, slant magnets in there. And so even the way that the magnets are oriented to each other help cause the motor to run in a certain direction, uh, you know, and to, and to spin continuously in, in, in the same direction once it gets started in that same direction. So it's a little bit more complex than just, you know, simply explaining or just rotating a magnet through a, or a, uh, rotating a uh, uh, iron cores through a magnetic field. I mean, you know, there's a little more to it than that, and that which is which there always is. You know, it, like how we started with this super complex atomic theory. Um, understand that the motors that we see, if you were to actually take them apart, you would find things in there that would be like, well, what is this? You know, this is in addition to things like what we deal with with capacitors and understanding capacitance and uh, induced electromotive force and all those types of things into the into the rotor. But basic, boil it down to its principle. What we're doing is we're running electricity through wires and that electricity running through wires is causing magnetism which is then causing this thing to spin.
Okay, and so if you make it much more complex than that in the way that you think about it, then it becomes like, well, I don't really understand electricity. But if you take those basic building blocks and then build on it in order to understand even further, um, you can actually get somewhere. This is something that I really like to talk about because I find it very interesting. Because I actually didn't really fully understand this until very recently. Um, you know, if you've ever looked outside of your house, uh, up on if you have a power pole, which I do, of course, um, because I live in the boonies, but yeah, so you have this power pole, and up on this power pole, there's a transformer, okay? And so you see these wires coming in, and then coming out of that transformer, there's two wires, but really one main wire that goes in, and then it goes into your, into your meter box. And then there's, you know, there's a, a neutral wire down at the bottom, but it doesn't, you know, it, it's not as high. You know, it's not the one that it seems to be real worried about. Uh, but you have this one, you have this, you have this one wire that goes in, and then I'm, did I say that right? No, then you have two coming out. You have two coming out, and then a neutral going in. But generally speaking, the one going into your transformer, which is what I was trying to say, is just one main wire and then a ground. Well, they take that one wire, and then they have two wires coming out of that transformer. And when you, and when you're, you know, looking at different appliances in your house, you'll have some appliances that are 120 volts, and you'll have some appliances that are 240 volts. For example. Uh, your air conditioner is 240 volts generally. Um, your, your plugs in your house are going to be 120 volts. Uh, your uh, dryer is going to be 240 volts. Your oven is going to be 240 volts. Well, how do you produce this 240 volts when coming into the transformer before it goes into your house, you only have one wire? Well, first of all, understand that a transformer is an interesting device in that there is no connection between the primary and secondary of the transformer. So you have this high voltage power coming in to the transformer, and then you have coming out to your house a usable voltage, 120 or 240 volts. So how does it go from being this high voltage to a lower voltage before it enters your house? Well, what it actually does is, is it uses magnetism. So you have these wraps of wire on one side that will have a greater number of wraps on the higher voltage side, and then a lesser number of wraps on the lower voltage side that goes to your house. And the magnetism that's created, there's a magnetic field that's created that induces a voltage. It creates because magnetism causes there to be a voltage flow or electron flow. Watch about a force, potential difference, whatever you want to call it. Um, because you have fewer wraps of wire over here, uh, you have lower voltage over here, and it's really that simple. So, for example, if I had, let's you know, for the sake of a for the sake of a round number, let's say that I had uh, 120 volts coming out and I have 1,200 volts going in. Well, all of it is is a 10 to 1 ratio. So that means that there's 10 times as many wraps on this side of wire as there is on this side. You'd think it would have to be more complex than that, but it's not. It's just that. 10 times less wraps of wire, so you get um, you get a 10 times reduction in the voltage output. So, so there's that side of it, but then how do you get two different wires? How do you bring one wire in and then you get two different 240 volt wires? And how do you get how do you get I mean two different 120 volt wires? And how do you get 240 volts out of that? When it comes to understanding that whole thing about potential difference, this makes 120 volts and 240 volts make a whole lot more sense is that you have the center line, which represents a state of normalcy. And this is what a 120 volt sine wave looks like. And really, this representation is exactly what's created by that big magnet that's churning over at the power plant. Because over at the power plant, you have this, you know, this big turning magnet that's then inducing this voltage into this wire and it's creating this, this sine wave. Okay? So what you're see, what the sine wave that's being seen at your outlet is a direct connection to what's occurring at the power plant, which I always think is interesting. So you have this that's occurring at 60 uh, cycles per second. So from here to here, you have 60 of these per second, which is where we get the term 60 hertz. You've, I'm sure you've probably heard that before, 60 hertz. Essentially, the power is going on and off 60 times. Uh, per second, or making one full cycle 60 times per second. Um, so this is 120 volts. So it goes to peak power and then down to peak power because this is just as much peak power as this is peak power because the difference from here to here. Again, it doesn't matter which way. But in a 240 volt circuit, it's exactly opposite. You have an exactly opposite 120 volt, exactly opposing 120 volt circuit. So when you measure from here to here, it's 120 volts. From here to here, it's 120 volts. But from here to here, it's 240 volts because they're peaking and valleying at exactly opposite moments. 
Now, how does that happen? Because it starts with one wire going into your transformer. Here's how it happens, which I think is fascinating. They take the two, they take they take the two wires that are going into your house and they wrap them in opposite directions around the core. So you have one going this way, wrapping around, and then you have another one wrapping around the opposite direction. So as that magnetism is inducing into that, as the, as the magnetism is being induced into those wraps of wire going into your house, it's creating one that, uh, set of electrons that are flowing one direction and one set that are flowing in the exact opposite direction within the same transformer. And so then it outputs two separate 140 volt, 120 volt circuits to your house, which is very interesting. So then in your house, you have the, and the reason why they do it is for that reason, that you can have a, a more safe electricity to use for general, you know, daily use in your computer or whatever. And then you have a higher voltage, a higher um, But both the wires are coming out of the transformer are 120. Two. And Correct. Independently. independently 120. Correct. And then they get combined in your house in the right areas. I, I like to always use water whenever I can, and I like to think of electron flow like water. Um, when I think of electrical potential, for example, I think of your I think of your outlets as being uh, little spigots with high pressure, and you can turn them on, and by turning them on, you allow the, the electrons to flow. Well, how we turn them on is by plugging the thing in, and now you create a path for it to flow. Because unlike Unlike uh, water, electricity wants to flow from one state to another through a conductor, not just in open air the way water can. You know, I can squirt you with water here, but in the, in, the in the electron world, this air between us is a great barrier. It's, it's opposite. You know, so the, in the electron world, it would be happy to flow through a sheet of metal, a sheet of copper or something, because that would be, this, that would be the equivalent of air to it. Um, but, but because of that, we don't, we don't have a path. So creating a path around this circuit is the same. I'm making a gateway by plugging in my... Uh, my outlet my plug to that outlet so I'm creating I'm creating a path or circuit for those electrons to essentially run is a really simplistic way of looking at it so when I create a circuit for them to run from here to here that's a 120 volt circuit when I'm creating a circuit for them to run from here to here now I'm creating a 240 volt circuit did you explain that the middle section is neutral we will we'll, uh, we'll call it neutral but really it's it's a state of equilibrium because it can be ground too you right. know we'll call it neutral the reason why we use the word neutral is because it's neutral it's, it represents equilibrium. It re represents the same way that the air here represents equilibrium for the ice or the hot metal bar. You know, they, they work until they get to, they give up heat or absorb heat until they reach that state of equilibrium. So this represents a state of equilibrium. But when you connect a path from here, instead of connecting the path from here to here, you're connecting it from here to here. Now you're creating a greater differential. So how that looks practically is what Jason is saying, that when we're plugging into a plug in your wall, there's one hot, is what we'll call it, which is 120 volts, and then one neutral. And so when it when it goes to neutral, that's essentially is, is ground. It's just an equilibrium state. When you go to a 240 volt circuit, you have the two opposing leads that are connecting to each other. So they're both hot, but they're hot oppositely. Which is why if you were to go up to a 240 volt circuit, stick your finger in one of them. I don't advise that you do this, but stick your finger in one side and then you know grab something metal. It's going to shock you exactly the same as it would if you stuck it in a 120 volt outlet in your house. Now, if you took both your fingers and you stuck it in both of those sides of the 240 volt circuit, now you're going to get the full 240 volts. Cool. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So when we talk about potential difference, again, that's another, that's why they use that term. There's a potential difference creating flow. So there's a greater potential difference between here and here than there is from here to here. Um, I want to try to define some, some terms that you hear a lot and in a very simplistic way. You'll hear the terms amp, volt, Ohm and watt. Okay, uh, it's important to understand the difference. If you're not going to understand anything else, it's important to recognize that in uh, most cases, when people are talking about electricity, they almost use amp, volt, and watt interchangeably. They're just saying there's electricity, but really they're representing completely different concepts, completely different um, uh, explanations of what's happening with electricity or electron flow. Okay, so first let's talk about, I, I like to talk about this in terms of a highway, okay? Think of a, a wire or a conductor like a highway. All right, if I were to stand on the side of a highway that's in rush hour traffic, okay, and I were to take a picture, and it was just a still shot, and I saw all these cars lined up, I would say, I showed it to someone, I'd say, look at there, that's a busy road. a lot of cars on that road. They would say, wow, there's a lot of cars on that road. 
But all that I'm doing, those cars may not be moving at all. They may just be sitting there. They may sit there for hours. I said, look, look at all those cars. Think of the cars on the road like amperage. Okay? We're saying this is how many cars there are at this moment. Snapshot, boom, cars. Okay? It has nothing to do with how fast they're going. On the same, in the same way, I could talk about voltage, and I could say, I could go there at 2 in the morning, and there's some you know, guy in a Kawasaki Ninja going 300 miles an hour or whatever, and you probably can't go that fast in a bus. He's going real fast. And, uh, uh, and I could say, wow, this road is busy, because there's a really fast guy on this road. Right? Well, it may not be busy, it just may be the one guy in this Kawasaki Ninja going impossibly fast, 300 miles an hour, remember that. So, neither really gives you the full picture. One is telling us how fast are the cars going. The other is, tell, is asking how many cars are there, right? At a given moment, how many cars are there? How many cars are there, right? So, how many cars are there? How fast are they going? That's a really unscientific explanation, Sam. But it, but it works as a way to kind of help us think about what we're talking about when we say voltage. So when we say voltage and amperage, what we're really saying is velocity, force, that's voltage. Quantity of electrons, that's amperage. Wattage is combining the two. How many cars, how fast are they going? So it, it, you could say something like wattage would be like, all right, how many cars are passing this point per minute? That would be a way of explaining kind of what wattage is. It's an overall picture of how much electrons are being moved over a period of time. Okay? Does that make sense? You follow me there? All right, now ohms. What is ohms? Well, ohms is the resistance to the flow. So think of the road and think of the bottleneck. So you'd say, all right, well, you've got, you've got a capacity on this road to go so fast, but then you reach this point and the road gets down a bit small. So the cars have to go one by one. Ohms represents resistance. So it's saying how much resistance to the flow of cars are there on this road. And we tend to think in terms of a bottleneck, but really, when you're talking about any type of conductor, any type of circuit, really all that matters is the total resistance of that circuit. I, I had a, uh, at AC school, I had my instructor ask us this class. He said, okay, if you have two extension cords, one's a real big fat one, and one's a little skinny one, and you've got to run a real big saw at the end of this extension cord. How are you going to hook up the extension cords to get the most out of what you've got? You've got a big fat one, you got a little skinny one. Are you going to put the big fat one, plug it into the wall, and then take the little skinny one? Or are you going to put the little skinny one in first and then hook up the big, the big fat one? Which one are you going to do? Any, any, any impressions? Fat one first. Fat one How long first. are the cars? Because that's what everyone always says, the fat one first, right? You hook up the fat one first and then the skinny one. Well, the truth is that it makes no difference because that electricity has to flow through that entire path. And so it doesn't make any difference which one you put first. It matters what the entire, what the resistance of that entire circuit is. Does that make sense? And so when we're talking about um, Ohm's law, I, and this is kind of a funny thing, but I is amperage, V is voltage, R is resistance. So amperage equals voltage divided by resistance. So they have a correlating effect to each other. So you can work that algebraically and you can you know, solve for any one of those if you have any other two. But in principle, without going into the math of it, because we don't really work, the real world doesn't apply the math of Ohm's law very much. The thing to understand is that the greater uh, the, greater the resistance that you have, the less amperage you have. So in a light bulb, in any circuit, if you apply more resistance to the circuit, you're going to have less draw on the circuit. You're going to have less electrons moving through the circuit. And it, and it becomes strange because I remember um, when I first was, I was working on a heat strip kit. And um, I had a heat strip kit and it was drawing, what was it doing? It was drawing too high of amperage. That's what it was. Drawing a little bit too high of amperage. So I thought to myself, how am I going to reduce? Because a heat strip kit, all it is is just a wrap of wire. It's just a, you know, and the electrons flow through it and it gets hot and air flows over it and it heats the air, right? So I thought to myself, I need to reduce the amperage of this circuit. What am I going to do? Oh, of course, what did I do? Whatever I do, I cut some off. Well, cutting some off <laughs> actually increased the amperage because what I did is I reduced the resistance. And what's interesting is, is that often people will think in terms of, well, greater resistance equals more heat. And so heat, no, it, that's all messed up thinking. Less resistance equals more amperage. More can flow through with less resistance. 
And then the voltage is essentially the rate or velocity at which the electrons, the force behind the electrons that causes them to pull through. So if you have uh, a voltage where that's a million volts, well, then you're going to get more amperage at the same resistance because the resistance is usually static. You know, the resistance stays the same. A light bulb has, you measure it, it has so much resistance, that doesn't change. So the, fluctuating the voltage will then change the amperage. But if you can fluctuate the resistance, that will also change the amperage. The amperage is kind of more of the result of, of that equation. But when you throw in the time quotient, then you start to get the, the wattage, you know, the overall picture of how much power is being consumed. How does this all apply? What does this mean? It's pretty simple. I could probably give about a five-hour class on just basic electricity. Applied electricity is about generating electricity, creating paths, and controlling those paths. I like to talk about power generation because understanding power generation, how it's created in the first place, understanding magnetism, opens up a lot of doors in your mind about why things work the way that they do. Um, but understanding that really what we're all what we're talking about here with electricity is we're talking about creating a differential, an energy differential, and then creating a path for the electrons to get from here to here. And, when, and while they get from here to here, then they do their work, whatever it is that we want them to do. Whether we want them to, to generate heat through an electrical coil, whether we want them to make sound, whether or not they, we want them to uh, create magnetism in order to drive a motor or, or pull in a solenoid with a magnet or whatever. Um, that's really what we're saying all along is how can we control this circuit? We can turn it on and off with the switch opening and closing it or whatever, but we're controlling this path. Magnetism has a huge role in electrical generation and use. Really. Practically speaking, we really only see two different uses of electricity in our day-to-day -day lives. We see it in resistive loads, which are things like heaters, and we see it in magnetic loads. That's pretty much what we're doing. And really, what we're doing usually with magnetism is we're taking electricity and we're turning it into kinetic energy. We're turning it into um, something that moves something with using magnetism. Or we're turning it into light, which is really heat, honestly. I mean, that's they're, they're directly related to each other, which is, generally speaking, a resistive load. We're just running electricity through, it's creating heat, creating light, it's a byproduct of that. Um, recognition that electricity seeks uh, equilibrium or normalcy by using the available paths is a useful way to think about how it looks. So just like what I was talking about with water, think about the, the as, as pipes are to water, think of wires to electricity. So when you're thinking about a pipe, you're not going to say, well, okay, I, I open up the pipe and the water didn't flow. Well, what's the pipe hooked to? Why would the water flow? Those are the kinds of questions you would ask. And you open up a faucet and no water comes out, you say, what happened to the pump, right? In the same way with electricity. There's electric there's electrons all around us and they're not flowing very, you know, in a very radical way. Meaning that I can touch this desk, I'm full of electrons, the desk is full of electrons, there's no transfer because we're at equilibrium with each other. Now if I create a differential by dancing around on this rug in my socks and up and then I touch it, then maybe I'll get some to touch that chair. Um, anytime that you see something that's occurring. Uh, especially if you're technical or you want to know more about it. Anytime you see something that's occurring, just look up how that works, and you'll find out that it always comes back to, generally speaking, uh, a lot of magnetism and a lot of resistive loads that are causing heat and light. That's... Any other questions? Thoughts? All right, sounds good.